a few months ago, I drove up to Westfield to have dinner with my parents. And when I left, they sent me home with a number of boxes, each containing old projects and report cards from when I was little. And this was a win-win because my parents got to get boxes out of their garage, and I got to take a fun stroll down memory lane. Well, it turns out that childhood J and adulthood J are nearly identical. For instance, I found an old project where we had to cut out magazine pictures of objects whose names begin with each letter of the alphabet. Four-year-old J chose to incorporate pictures of farm equipment and various agricultural commodities for a number of his letters. For the letter C, I used pictures of corn and a combine, bright red Massey Ferguson, as I recall. Well, with so many of the items that I took out of these boxes, I kept saying, yeah, that sounds about right. And this was especially true as I read through the handwritten comments on the report cards. Well, seemingly every year, my teachers wrote something to the effect that Jay is a very nice young man, but we can't get him to keep his mouth shut. He's always yapping. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, I had a lot to say as a child and frankly, not much has changed as I grew into adulthood. Well, today we're gonna look at another man who also had a lot to say and also refused to keep his mouth shut. But to set the tone for that discussion, I wanna make a few qualifying remarks. Now, every 4th of July, while we honor our founding fathers airing their grievances 245 years ago, we don't do so with any kind of animosity towards the present day United Kingdom. Sure, we disagree with Queen Elizabeth on certain things, but we also have lots in common. Our countries exist today as Western allies who just employ different expressions of constitutional government. And although we still have some differences, the British are by no means an enemy. In today's discussion of the Protestant Reformation, will be done with the same attitude that we have towards the American Revolution. While we honor Martin Luther airing his grievances 500 years ago, we don't do so with any kind of animosity towards the present day Roman Catholic Church. Sure, we disagree with Pope Francis on certain things, but we also have lots in common. And our churches exist today as brothers, sisters, and friends in Christ who just employ different expressions of Christianity. And although we still have some differences, the Roman Catholic Church is by no means an enemy, and I want that very clearly understood. Now, there's no getting around the fact that the Protestant Reformation caused an earth-shattering division in the church. And while some tensions still linger, relations have improved more in the past 50 years than probably at any other time in history. And since the late 1960s, the way that millions of people worldwide experience and understand Christianity has changed due in large part to events of the Reformation. Worship is conducted in languages spoken by the masses. The Bible is printed in languages spoken by the masses. And it's something that you'll find in people's homes where it's encouraged to be read and pondered and discussed. And that hasn't always been the case. But more importantly though, our focus today is on how the Reformation drastically changed the way people understand salvation. Now, any discussion of the Protestant Reformation can start with two Latin words, et and sola. Et means and, sola means alone. Et versus sola, and versus alone. And those two words became the center of debate around how people could be saved and go to heaven et versus sola, and versus alone. And that's where we meet Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest and theology professor in Germany in the early 1500s. And he looked at the way that the church was operating in his day, and something just didn't quite sit right with him. So many aspects of what the church did at that time stemmed from a notion that salvation came through faith in Jesus Christ, et tradition. Remember, et is the Latin word for and. So, faith in Jesus Christ and tradition. 
Well, tradition was effectively a catch-all term for a lengthy list of expectations that church leaders at that time were putting on their members. So in the early 1500s, it was being taught that salvation came through faith in Jesus Christ and doing good works and attending church regularly and being baptized and confessing your sins to the priest and serving penance and showing reverence to the Virgin Mary and receiving last rites and purchasing indulgences and, and, and ad nauseum. Well, between his roles as both a priest and a theology professor, you might say that Martin Luther had read the Bible a few times. And the more he read, or rather the more he pondered about what he read, the more he began to feel that the teachings of the church in his day were deviating from the teachings of the Bible. And he felt that it was getting to a point where these traditions, which derived from the opinions of the Pope and other church leaders, were being treated as equal or arguably greater authority than the authority of Scripture. And in Luther's mind, the more the church leaned on the opinions of its leaders instead of the teachings of the Bible, the more things just seemed a little off. And I'll give you a sense of what this looks like in practical terms. So my senior year at Purdue, in lieu of a final exam, one of my political science professors required us instead to write a lengthy paper in which we'd make a case for or against certain foreign policy initiatives. And we were supposed to take theories we had learned from our book readings and use those to form the basis of our argument. Well, let me tell you a little secret about being a poor college student. Sometimes you pick and choose which books you purchase. If you can't afford all your books, sometimes you leave a few on the shelf and try to make do on your own. Well, this particular course was one where I chose not to purchase the books. Well, when it came time to write the final paper, I formed my arguments based off of my own personal opinions, not based off of the theories spelled out in the books I had neglected. My professor gave me a B on the paper, and he said, Mr. Wood, your arguments are interesting, but they're just a collection of your own personal thoughts, not backed by the theories taught in our course readings. Well, in much the same way that my political science professor took issue with the message of that paper being a collection of my personal thoughts, not backed by the authority of college books, Martin Luther, the theology professor, took issue with the message of the church in his day being a collection of the Pope and other church leaders' personal thoughts, not backed by the authority of Scripture. Well, looking at the state of the church at that time, Professor Luther probably sounded a lot like the guy who taught my class, pointing out that these traditions are interesting, but they're a collection of personal thoughts, not backed by the theories of the book we are reading. Well, remember one of those Latin words I mentioned earlier, sola, which means alone? Well, Luther's efforts to reform the church are summed up in five solas. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Solus Christus, Christ alone. And soli deo gloria, the glory of God alone. And to understand Martin Luther, I think it helps to go in that order because the beginning of his argument is that when it comes to the question of how people can be saved and go to heaven, we should not rely on scripture and the opinions of church leaders. We should be relying on scripture alone. Well, the church at that time was relying on scripture at. Scripture and. and Martin Luther said no. On this central question of salvation, we should be relying on sola scriptura, the authority and sufficiency of scripture alone. Well, with scripture as our foundation, we can then understand sola gratia, grace alone, because scripture alone assures us that we are saved by grace alone. Titus Chapter 3, beginning with verse 5, says, God saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. 
Well, reading this, Martin Luther couldn't make sense of why the church in his day put requirements on people to do all sorts of good works and, 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 when what he's reading in scripture is that God saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Titus chapter 3 goes on to say, God poured out mercy on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we become heirs with the confident expectation of eternal life. Scripture alone, sola scriptura, assures us that we are saved by grace alone, sola gratia, through faith alone, sola fide, in Christ alone, solus Christos. Back to the text. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. This is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Well, again, Martin Luther is wondering how the church in his day could be requiring people to do all sorts of good works and, 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 when what he's reading in scripture is that God saved us by his grace through our faith alone in Jesus Christ, not by our works. Well, in this struggle to understand how we as imperfect sinners could be saved and go to heaven to spend eternity with a perfect God, the more Luther spent time in the word, the clearer his answer became. Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Picking up in verse 28, it says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Well, scripture alone assures us that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. For what purpose? For the glory of God alone. Soli Deo Gloria. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, says, It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have found the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise us. And this grace that is reaching more and more people will cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Our salvation, which comes by grace, is not for our own glory. It's for the glory of God, solely Deo. Gloria. Well, in all of these passages, Luther sees no et, no and, no also, no plus. You know, that passage from 2 Corinthians said, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Well, Martin Luther believed, and with an increased confidence in his convictions, he was ready to speak out and begin questioning the practices of the church in his day. Well, at that time, the institution worked very well for the powers that be. Church leaders didn't want anybody upsetting the apple cart. So when Luther posted his 95 Theses in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517, it caused quite an uproar. And to get a sense of the repercussions, picture this. Suppose I walk into Honey Creek United Methodist Church one day and I start smashing the pews with a sledgehammer. Reverend Bohall and the administrative council might ask me to leave and never come back. The church might decide that I'm a dangerous man, but their decision would be separate from that of, let's say, Sheriff Burgess, who might determine that I'm a bad guy in the eyes of Johnson County. Well, in January 1521, 
Pope Leo X excommunicates Martin Luther, deciding that he is a dangerous heretic in the eyes of the church. But it was now time for Emperor Charles V to decide if Martin Luther was a bad guy in the eyes of the government. It's two separate decisions. So Charles V organized a trial in Worms, Germany. Now that's spelled W-O-R-M-S, which in English looks like worms, but in German it's pronounced Worms. So this trial is known as the Diet of Worms. Well, the title looks a little goofy, but in this case, a diet refers to a meeting of the emperor and several princes. So we aren't talking about ordering a box of low calorie earthworms from Jenny Craig. We're talking about a meeting of government officials in Worms, Germany. Well, Martin Luther expects this trial to be an opportunity for some dialogue about his beliefs. But instead on April 17th, 1521, Charles V points to a stack of Luther's writings and asks, are you the author of these books? Yes. Will you recant everything that you've written here? Well, not wanting to throw the baby out with the bathwater, Luther asks if the question can be a little more specific, since many of his writings had non-controversial items that were accepted by even those who otherwise disagreed with him the most, including Pope Leo X. Well, Emperor Charles V says no. You either recant everything or nothing. Well, this is huge because refusing to recant could very well cost Martin Luther his life. So he asks if he can take the night to think it over. Well, Charles V reluctantly agrees. And that night, Luther kept asking himself, am I alone wise? And what he meant by that was, am I the only person that sees this? Am I the only person who's read the scriptures? Am I the only person who feels like things aren't matching up here? Am I alone wise? Well, Martin Luther could draw strength from a story in Acts chapter four. The apostles Peter and John faced a similar situation. They too were being held by the authorities and were forced to answer questions about their belief in Jesus Christ. Well, Peter remembers Jesus telling the disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, Jesus didn't say that we were saved by a mediator or by doing good works. We aren't saved by who we are or what we've done. We're saved because of who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Well, with that in mind, in verse 12, Peter responds to the authorities saying, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Peter goes on to say in verse 20, as for us, we cannot help speaking out about what we have seen and heard. Well, for Martin Luther being inspired to speak out is easier read than done, so he began praying something like this. Dear God, almighty and everlasting, this dreadful world is swallowing me, testing my faith. And if I had to rely on my own strength, I'd be sunk. I can't take on this powerful assembly by myself. I need your help. I would gladly spend my days in happiness and peace, but instead I chose to take up your righteous and everlasting cause. I need you, Lord. Can you hear me? Are you even there? Oh, who am I kidding? I know you're there. You chose me for this work and I'm ready to accomplish your will. Please don't forsake me now. You are my defense and my stronghold. 
This world is full of devils, but I'm prepared to lay down my life for your holy cause. This world might take my body, but my soul belongs to you. I have your inspired word to assure me of that. God, please, please help me. Amen. Well, the next day was April 18th, 1521, 500 years ago as of the day that this sermon was presented. Well, Martin Luther arrives back at the Diet where Charles V asks him again, essentially a life or death question of whether Luther will recant all of his writings or else face likely condemnation as a heretic. Now I'm gonna tell you the rest of this story slightly out of order, only because Luther's speech to the assembly makes for a more climactic ending to my sermon. So I'm gonna save that for the end. Now first I'm gonna give you a little bit of a spoiler and tell you that Martin Luther refuses to recant his writings, but he also avoids being put to death as a heretic. So Luther has about a week between the time that he gives his response and the time that Charles V reaches a final verdict. So during that window, Luther wants to get the heck out of Dodge because he knows that it's only a matter of time before the authorities come after him. Now what he doesn't know is that his local prince, a man named Frederick the Wise, who was part of this diet assembly, secretly wants to help him. Well, as Martin Luther is leaving town, leaving the trial, Frederick the Wise instructs his lieutenants to kidnap Martin Luther and take him somewhere safe, someplace Charles V will never find him, which ends up being the castle in, Vor in Vortburg, Germany. Now the twist here, and this is a really cool story, is that he also instructs his lieutenants not to tell him where they've hid Luther. So that way, when Charles V is asking around about the whereabouts of Martin Luther, Frederick the Wise can honestly say, I have no idea. Brilliant. Well, Luther gets kidnapped and carried off to the Vortburg Castle. He hides out there, successfully evades Charles V, goes on to live another 25 years, and today we celebrate him as this great reformer. Well, we celebrate Martin Luther because in that pinnacle moment at the Diet of Worms, he didn't back down. He didn't fold like a cheap card table. He took inspiration from a passage of scripture that many people credit with being the first to catch his eye and inspire his revolution of reform. And that passage is found in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed by faith from first to last, for as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, adequately inspired, Martin Luther launches into a very powerful monologue in which he says, in so many words, number one, I'm not sure why you're asking me to recant everything, because some of what I've written is universally accepted. And number two, excuse me that I'm not going to sit idly by while the decisions of the church leaders contradict the Bible in ways that range from errors at best to corruption and tyranny at worst. I'm going to leave you with Luther's final words to the Diet. Listen carefully. He said, Since your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer non canutum, without horns. Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. 
Amen.